Hi, everybody. My name is James Bartlett, and I'm a field scientist with ASL Environmental Sciences. I live on the west coast of Canada. Um, I've got two little kids that wake up constantly in the night. My uh, my presentation was scheduled to be about three o'clock in the morning my time, so I thought it might be a little bit safer to try and do a recorded presentation rather than uh, a live one and have you guys listen to them crying. <laughs> so. Um, one of my most recent uh, field projects was uh, on the east coast of Canada in the Nunatsiavut region of Labrador, and I uh, deployed an enhanced ice profiling sonar. So I was going to talk to you a little bit about that today. So some of you might already know about the uh, ASL ice profiler already, but I'll start with a quick introduction to the instrument. Um, this study made use of a prototype IPS-5 with a logarithmic detector. So one of the things we wanted to look at um, was to get a better idea of whether or not the log IPS could bring various target types out of saturation. Um, so we'll look at that a little bit. Um, both the traditional linear IPS-5 and the log IPS have the ability to record up to five targets but we wanted to confirm how the new log IPS performed with respect to handling multiple targets. So we have some new results to look at there. Um, we also looked at backscatter amplitude as it related to different target types. And we'll also take a look at a few acoustic profiles as well. All right. ASL's ICE profiling sonar is a single frequency sonar device that sits on the ocean floor or in a taut line mooring configuration, like you see in the diagram to the left. Uh, it's used to measure ICE draft, and uh, it was first developed at the Institute of Ocean Sciences in, uh, in Canada. Following that, further research was done um, by ASL to develop uh, and commercialize the product. The first commercial use of the ICE profiler was in 1996 out of Russia off Sakhalin Island. Um, following that, additional work was done to uh, develop the IPS-5. The IPS-5 uh, was introduced in 2008. It had a faster sample rate. Um, was able to record multiple uh, multiple targets per ping. Um, it had an increased number of phases, more memory, and uh, the ability to do wave measurements as well. Um, since then, um, more research and development has been done to develop the log IPS, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. ASL's log IPS is a further development of the IPS-5 ICE profiler. It has a logarithmic detector with 85 decibels of instantaneous dynamic range. The goal of this uh, developing this log detector is to record weak targets as well as strong targets um, out of saturation. So we wanted to have enough range that uh, Weak targets didn't fall below the noise floor, and strong targets didn't get clipped. So development of the log IPS uh, started in 2013. We initially started looking at data that had been recorded by the traditional IPS-5 and simulated what it would look like on the log IPS. Um, in 2014, we did some testing in local waters around Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Um, and then in 2015, 2016, we had it out in the Arctic for its first uh, ice measurements um, in the Beaufort Sea. Uh, during that test, we detected some, uh, some issues with the electronics and we uh, identified some areas of improvement there. Um, 
made some adjustments and put it back out in 2017, 2018 for another overwinter and uh, full year deployment uh, in the Beaufort Sea again. <clears throat> um, following that, we were able just before just before COVID hit in 2020 to get the log AIPS out for some new measurements um, in Eastern Canada um, off the coast of Labrador. And so that's the study that we'll be focusing this presentation on. In February, 2020, ASL collaborated with the Nunat Siavit First Nation government in Labrador to study the ice in the coastal waters about 40 kilometers east of the town of Nain. Uh, traditional hunting and fishing activities are undertaken in this region, but the changing climate has, uh, has provided a greater urgency to understand the ice conditions in this area and to manage the risks that are associated with it. Um, in the bottom, bottom right, near the top of the image, um, it's possible to see an area of open water surrounded by ice. This type of feature is known locally as a rattle, um, and it remains ice-free throughout the year. Uh, this rattle was located about halfway between the town of Nain and where we placed the mooring. Um, in other parts of the world, I think these features are also known as Paulinia. So a second secondary objective of this study was to understand how these rattles affect the ice and the biology in the waters around them. Uh, because it was February and everything was frozen, it, getting out to the site was a bit of an adventure for me. <laughs> um, we loaded up all the gear onto a few sleds um, and towed, the, towed it out by Skidoo to the, to the deployment location. <clears throat> I think it was around minus 45 or something like that that day and uh, one of the coldest days of the year, but it was uh, the only time we could get out there without a bunch of fog and winds uh, blowing over a gale. So <laughs> um, yeah, it's cold, but uh, the best, the best opportunity we had to get out there. Um, once we got out onto the site, uh, we cut a hole in the ice and assembled the mooring and deployed the mooring through the through the ice. Um, the mooring was deployed in about 100 meters of water um, in an area where we expected to see a, a pretty dynamic ice regime, especially through the spring and summer as things melted up. So this, uh, this slide shows that we had quite a bit of variability in what passed over top of the mooring. Um, in one day, over about a 16 hour period in May, we had open water at the beginning of the day uh, with waves and turned into calm water later in the day. Um, and then following that in the, in the afternoon and evening, we had uh, ice keels moving into the water about uh, depth of about eight meters. Um, at other times, not shown here, uh, we saw keels up to about 13 meters in depth. Um, so this gave us a really interesting environment to further test the capabilities of the log apps. Okay, so here we have a histogram of the acoustic backscatter for two different time periods. Uh, at the time of writing, the data has not been fully analyzed, but as a way of looking at target type, we broke the deployment into two parts, winter shown in red and the full deployment shown in blue. The full deployment being from February to November, 2020. In both cases, the number of observations tends to zero as acoustic backscatter approaches the limit of the A to D, around 65,000 counts. <clears throat> um, the, the red curve, we know that is dominated mainly by ice and has a single peak, while the uh, 
blue plot shows uh, ice as well as open water. Um, and we can see that in both cases, the, uh, the ice and open water are brought out of saturation. <clears throat> um, interesting also to note is the uh, open water period seems to have two peaks. Um, and we don't fully understand why yet. We suspect that it might have something to do with the sea state at, at the time. Uh, this histogram is from our 2017-2018 deployment in the Beaufort Sea. Um, we've had a little more time to go through this da uh, data in more detail and ad identify the different target types. Um, while we do see some overlap in backscatter signal from different target types, this allows us to start assigning odds to what we are seeing. Below 40,000 counts uh, is likely to be deformed ice. Uh, the probability of level ice and deformed ice is similar above 45,000 counts and drops off with increasing backscatter. And then as you increase above 50,000 counts, the probability of open water increases. Okay, so this slide shows the capability of the ice profiler to record up to five targets. <clears throat> um, we've broken down the number of times the IPS recorded one, two, three, four, or five targets over the last uh, three trial deployments. The, the first plot, um, which is shown in blue, is recorded by the linear uh, IPS-5, which is has been included here for comparison. Um, the first, the obvious thing that uh, we notice is the lower number of single targets and large number of incidents where five targets were recorded during the 2014-2015 uh, study. We were unsure at the time if this was going to be consistent with log IPS measurements but we have since determined through subsequent deployments shown in the, in the green and the purple plots um, that the issue was related to um, a bug in the electronics of the, uh, the log IPS. Um, that has since been corrected and you can see that in the 2017 deployment and the 2020 deployment, um, we were <coughs> We we're able to determine that the uh, the target detection algorithm behaves similar similarly in the log IPS as it does to the linear IPS. Okay, so in this slide, um, I just wanted to show some possible characterizations of ice features uh, shown in these um, acoustic backscatter echograms. Um, in panel one, in the top left. <coughs> It sh shows a two layer system with level ice and what may be frazzle ice where indicated there with the, the arrow. Met data from Nain at the time showed temperatures around zero degrees Celsius and winds eight meters per second easterly, which does not favor the formation of frazzle, but conditions east of Nain in the offshore um, where it might've been colder and had um, additional heat loss driven by the wind, um, it's possible that the formation of frazzle may have occurred there. Um, so in the second panel um, on the top right corner, uh, this shows a period of deformed ice coverage with approximately four meter ice keels. It also shows periods of low backscatter, unconsolidated ice, and sections of higher backscatter ice. And then finally, in the third panel, we see um, level multi-year, um, level multi-layer system uh, with lower amplitudes than the first panel, um, probably due to the ice type. Also, the larger dynamic range appears to allow the IPS to peer into the ice a short distance. 
Uh, to summarize, um, this deployment <coughs> this deployment in Nain allowed us to test the log EFs in a new ICE regime. Due to uh, COVID-19, recovery of the data was delayed and process processing has not been complete yet, but we are working on that. And at the same time, we have, an <coughs> we have another year of uh, data collection underway in the same location. Um, oh, what we did learn from this um, is that, yes, uh, we were able to, the log IPS is able to bring the air water interface out of saturation, um, that the target detection algorithm behaves similarly to the traditional IPS, that there's a possible relationship between target type and amplitude, and that there appears to be an ability to see multi-layering and variations in backscatter strength through the ice. Now, thanks everybody for your time and for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me at my email address that's on the screen there, or um, I think there's also an opportunity to post comments below this video during the conference. Uh, thanks again.